So, you're going on a long driving tour. This driving tour incorporates mountain passes, switchbacks, some motorway sections and scenic roads. What type of car are you going to take? You're going to take a supercar or you're going to take a Grand Tourer? And by supercar, I'm referring to cars such as Ferrari 458, the Ferrari 488, the F8, the 296. And by Grand Tourer, I'm talking about cars such as the Ferrari F12 and the Ferrari 812. Hear me out, guys. This could get controversial. So first of all, we need to define what is a supercar. Now the legacy classification of a supercar is something that's rear mid-engined, outrageously styled, very flamboyant, nervous, edgy, and designed to invoke adrenalized excitement rather than practicality. Now a classic example of one of these cars would be a Lamborghini Countach. Now Lamborghini Countach is outrageously styled, incredible to look at, but is it very practical? These cars are often deeply flawed, how much of that styling is functional as opposed to just for flamboyant exotic looks? Pretty much all of it. But is that legacy classification still the case? I'm not so sure. So I've now driven over 11,000 miles in my Ferrari 458. And in that 11,000 miles, we've taken it on some incredible driving tours. The first one being the Modball Rally and the second one being the driving tour across Europe, which we did this year. Now the driving tour across Europe was over 3,000 miles, circa 3,100 miles to be more exact. Yes, we knew it was gonna be quite reliable and we knew it was gonna be sort of okay with its drivability, having already done the Modball Rally, which was over 1,000 miles. But you just don't know for sure. I mean, it's very different. 3,100 miles is very different to doing 1,000 miles. And of course, the, the, the mileage that we were doing was over a longer period of time. The first day of driving, we had to drive down from the southwest or we had to drive along from the southwest via the Euro Tunnel to Baden-Baden in Germany. That was a 12-hour stint in the car. And to be honest with you, it was a revelation. And yeah, that 12 hours, we'd stop for lunch, we had coffee breaks, etc. But it was a revelation. There was no issues whatsoever. And you'd feel, you'd think that with supercars have got very edgy, fast steering, whereas opposed to Grand Tourers, it's supposed to be softer on their steering, not so edgy, not so nervous. And we just didn't really have a problem with that. We stopped off at the old classic Rames race circuit on the way. Um, and you can see from the video sections, uh, you know, we're still quite relaxed and we're just having great fun. And we've, we've driven for hours at that point and it just, we weren't tired at all. I mean, the only, the only tiredness that I had was from the duration of, you know, being, being awake, but being, being up early and then traveling for 12 hours. It, the car wasn't tiring at all to drive. In fact, it was very excited. It was really super cool. On that driving trip, we had five cars that were on our driving trip. We had two 458 Spiders. We had a 991.1 Porsche GT3. We had an 812 GTS and we had a 488 Pista, a Ferrari 488 Pista. So it was quite a substantial selection of cars, but yet there was only really one car that was classified as a Grand Tour, which was the 812 GTS. Of course, the 812 GTS performed very well on the motorway sections on the scenic roads, etc., as you'd expect it to do. It was a very powerful car. It's front mid-engine, so the engine is quite set back, but all that engine is is front of you. You're pretty much sat on the rear axle on the 812, so you've got all that length in front of you, all that length of bonnet in front of you, which is great and fine, no problems whatsoever when you're driving motorway sections and scenic roads, etc. But once you start getting into aggressive mountain passes and aggressive switchbacks, some of those switchbacks were 180, 180 degree switchbacks. Hell, they were aggressive for the 458s and for the GT3, let alone for the bloody 812. He's done quite a bit of mileage in that car doing various different driving tours, so he's quite experienced. And he managed to manhandle the car around those, those passes and those switchbacks very well. But you could tell it was more cumbersome than the more agile supercars that we had on the trip, the Pista and the 458s and the GT3. When it got to some stages where the switchbacks were so aggressive and you had very little space to, to actually turn in close to, the, close to the apex and then carve around, the 812 had to do three point turns, so it had to, had to actually go forwards a bit, edge back and turn around and, and go forwards because obviously sometimes we had cars coming the other way as well. I think, okay, that's understandable for mountain passes and switchbacks, but surely the 812 was vastly superior to the supercars on the Grand Touring sections, on the motorway sections and, the, and on the toll roads, etc. Not really, um, not really. The, the, the Pista, the GT3, the 458s, they performed really well. There was no problem whatsoever. And I mean, 
apart from the heat, because it's incredibly hot, we had to put the roof up a few times and whack the air conditioning right on hard so that we could get cooled down because it was just brutally hot. There was no problems with the cars. It was great, you know? And yeah, the steering was a bit faster, but it, it wasn't, it's not aggressively fast on the 458. And the GT3, I've, I've driven those, I've driven GT3s before, as you know, and you know, that was fine. And by the way, just to let you know, we'll be reviewing a Pista soon. So watch out for the channel. Can make sure you subscribe for that content that's coming forward soon. But yeah, it was a revelation. There just wasn't the problem. As we progressed through the trip, we did loads more mountain passes and loads more mileage. It just compounded that perception that supercars did exceptionally well. There just wasn't the problem. There isn't really a need, guys, now to take a Grand Tourer on these sort of trips. Supercars are fine. Modern day supercars are fine on these sort of journeys. Yeah, you wouldn't want to take uh, one of the legacies, say a, um, a 355, a 328, a 308 or anything like that. You wouldn't want to take any of those and you wouldn't want to take a Mura or a Countach or a Diablo on any of these driving tours because number one, as I've talked about already, they're not very reliable, they're not practical, they're edgy, nervous and they're not really the type of cars to be able to take on those sort of trips. But modern day supercars, you can. Modern day supercars, have morphed into being part Grand Tora. So if you enjoyed the video, guys, please take a little bit of time to give it an upvote, to give it a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed, please think about subscribing. We've got some great, fantastic content to come in the future. Now, I have a theory why supercars have become part Grand Tora and have this additional capability now. It's how they're designed. They're designed to be more practical, more reliable. Um, for example, with the, with the supercars nowadays, especially with Ferrari supercars, you have a seven-year service pack. Ferrari wouldn't provide a seven-year service pack for cars, which they have from the 458 onwards, unless they knew the cars were going to be quite reliable. And their new power warranty that they provide, which in effect warrants the engine and the gearbox against catastrophic failure, they wouldn't provide those warranties if they were pretty sure that those engines were reliable and were stable and solid and they weren't going to have problems. They weren't going to have the legacy issues that the older cars had. They're designed, this, this capability is designed into these supercars now. Not only in the way that they're designed to be more reliable, more practical, better visibility, etc., but you also have the supportive driving aids that provide that practicality as well. So for example, you've got great parking sensors on most supercars. Yes, of course, if you option them, Ka-ching. Um, and you've got great rear view cameras on these cars now to help you with reversing. So any visibility issues that you had before, these rear view cameras overcome that and allow you to park the cars quite easily. And with later modern supercars, you've even got the 3D bird's eye view where you've got a bird's eye view like you're looking down on the car. So you can see all the obstacles around the car to get that great visibility and that great, great understanding of where the car is with regards to all, all its surroundings. So it makes it a lot more easier to maneuver. The 430 Scuderia inaugurated the perception of the bumpy road mode, the bumpy road mode button, which was then used downstream in 458, 488, F8 and obviously downstream cars. Now, what does that bumpy road mode button provide? It's actually very intelligent. It provides the ability to disengage the configuration of the suspension with the ECU setup of the road, drive, of the road driving configuration. So if you're configuring the car to be in sport mode or race mode, for example, yes, that would firm up the suspension more, but you can then put switch bumpy road mode and it makes the suspension softer. So that means if you're driving aggressive mountain passes or switchbacks, etc., and you want suspension to be firm, you can put it into sport or race mode, which is very common to use race mode when you're doing that sort of driving that sort of terrain. And you've got the driving mode quite performance. You've got the edginess in the supercar to give it that performant driving mode. Plus, you've got a firm suspension. But when you're on to motorway sections, more scenic routes, if you've got it in sport mode, then you can tune down that suspension, especially if the roads are uneven or bumpy or, or not very well surfaced. And you can press that bumpy road mode and it, it automatically softens the suspension. And you can press that bumpy road mode and that works for race mode and for sport mode. Now, for the passes, I'm using normal mode, I'm using normal sport mode, and I'm using race mode, but I'm using sport mode most of the time. It's only when I need aggressive gear changes and, um, and aggressive, uh, aggressive upshifts and aggressive downshifts on the gear changes that I put it into race mode. Um, everything happens quick, more quickly in race mode. I'm using sport mode though for most of the time. <laughs> Thank you. 
Also, when you're considering modern day Ferraris, they have magnetized suspension. And this, this is what enables you to configure the suspension from the Manatino, from the Manatino switch, which is in effect is the driving mode. So it, it changes the configuration of suspension, it makes it more harsher, etc. Whereas back in the day, you didn't have this flexibility, you didn't have the Manatino, you didn't have these driving modes, you didn't have the, the um, magnetized suspension in Ferraris, whereby you could change the viscosity of the oil that's used in your shock absorbers to be able to make them more compliant or to make them stiffer. This again moves the car to being a lot more flexible in its use and it enables it to be more part Grand Tourer. It enables it to be part Grand Tourer as well. And this is clearly why they're designing these cars this way. So they're very flexible. So they're not just the edgy, old styled, exotic, flamboyant supercars of the, of the of back in the old days, but they're more leading towards practicality and usability um, with the way how they're configuring the cars, with the way how they're setting the cars up with their suspension, their driving modes, and of course the reliability, seven year service packs and their warranties, etc. It's all shifted, it's all shifted to provide a lot more practical and a lot more drivable supercars. And that enables you to meet, and that enables you to take these cars on longer distance journeys. Now cars like the 458, the 488, etc. they're quite practical with regards to luxury compartment storage space. On our driving tour, for example, there was a 488 Pista and as there was two 458 Spiders. And of course there was the GT3. They were, they were the supercars and the 812 GTS was, was the Grand Tour. We had no problems putting our luggage in the front of the car, which is the front luggage compartment. And of course we had all our camera equipment as well for all the, so that we could create all the content for you guys um, for the whole duration of the of the European driving tour. No problems whatsoever. Yeah, it was tight and it was tightly packed in there, um, but we managed it. It wasn't such a problem. And because we've got quite a bit of space behind the driving seats, um, we were able to put some soft bags and some clothes, etc., behind the driving seats to free up some space from the front. That's pretty much how the other guys packed their cars as well. They put their main bags in the front of the car, in the front of the cars, especially the, the Pista and the, and the 458s. And they put some soft bits and pieces, the soft bags, etc., behind the behind the seats um, in that space that you had in that luggage compartment space. Now, about of course the 488 Pista because it's got that S duct in the front, it had a bit of removed front luggage compartment space. But the owner of the Pista still had enough space there for all the luggage requirements. Of course, it was only one person that was in that Pista. In our 458 Spider, there was two of us, and we had all our camera equipment as well. So, but we but we still managed to get it all in the car. So yeah, it was quite practical. Yeah, probably not as practical as a Grand Tourer with a massive boot, but what type of car are you gonna want on these sort of driving tours nowadays? If you've got aggressive mountain passes and switchbacks, I'm not so sure you'd take a Grand Tourer on these sort of journeys anymore now. I think that supercars have become a lot more reliable, a lot more capable, a lot more practical with how they're designed, configured. Um, yes, maybe they're not so flamboyant, they're not so excitingly designed, although, you know, what's not to like about the 458 Spyder, using that as an example, it's incredibly styled by Pininfarina, the last car that was the last, the last Ferrari supercar that was designed by Pininfarina. And of course, the F12 was the last Grand Tourer that was designed by Pininfarina. Awesome to look at, incredible to look at. Yes, not as outrageous as something like a Lamborghini Countach, but what would you rather have? Would you have, rather have something that's outrageously styled, flamboyant, but edgy, nervous, impractical, and unreliable or something like one of the modern day supercars that have that reliability. There was only one issue with regards to the 812. Now the 812, unfortunately, when we were at Chiavana in Italy um, at the Comradi Hotel, the 812 had a necessity because we didn't have parking up, um, didn't have enough parking space at the top. So the 812 had to go down a slipway and had to park underneath. So it had to go into an underground parking section, like a basement parking section. And that was very tight. And you've got that 812 again, you've got that whacking great V12 engine in front. It was very tight maneuvering that car down the very tight spaces on this, on this driveway. And I was very short on this very short, um, on this very short driveway that went down into the underground storage area. And also if we look at the new hybrid supercars that are coming to play, cars like the 296 and cars like the, uh, the McLaren Artura. And these cars should be very practical for taking on long driving tours. And they should be quite practical as being a Grand Tourer because they have that, that hybrid technology that's built into the ICE engine, in, into the internal combustion engine design. But not so much with these hybrids at the moment, they haven't quite got there yet. For example, with the 296, I've heard stories of where the 296s have left the owner stranded on the side of the road with total electrical failure. And that total electrical failure means they haven't even got the ability to put the bloody hazard warning lights on. So the car's stuck there, pretty much a dead brick. 
Um, you know, Ferrari have got to sort out those problems with the 296s. I mean, these cars are incredibly expensive. But in theory, those cars should lend themselves to being great supercars for doing the mountain passes and switchbacks and also have that grand tour capability with the luggage storage space and with the practicality with the hybrid technology so as you can switch it into electric mode when you need it to be quiet and when you don't want to disturb people. So let's revisit that question that I posed at the beginning of the video, guys. So you're going on a driving tour. That driving tour incorporates mountain passes and switchbacks, some motorway sections and scenic roads. What type of car are you going to take now? Are you going to take the supercar or are you going to take the Grand Tourer? I know what my decision is. Supercar every day of the week and twice on Sunday. I hope you enjoyed the video guys. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you in the next video.